Okay, welcome back everyone. We're here live in Las Vegas for IBM Pulse, IBM's exclusive coverage by SiliconANGLE and theCUBE. This is our flagship program. We go out to the events, extract the signal from the noise. And John John Furrier, the founder of Silicon AM, joined with my co-host Dave Vellante, co-founder of Wikibon.org. And we have one of the superstars on theCUBE, uh, CUBE alumni, tech <laughs> athlete, women in tech, uh, leader of our playlist of all-time views. Inhi Chusa, thank you for coming back again. Oh, my pleasure. On theCUBE. I'm excited uh, to be here. Dave and Thank I always you. perk up when you come on theCUBE because one, you're one of our favorite guests because you're dynamic, you're beautiful, and you're smart, and you're, you're the <laughs> GM. You're the GM, of, you're the GM of, you're the GM of big data, and it's a hot area. I'll give you my cell phone, you can call my husband. <laughs> <laughs> we beat that. He's watching right now. Um, so tell us, what's up with you? Uh, we're excited to have you here. What's, what's the update? What's going on? Big data, um, we're here at the cloud show. Cloud is, we've seen some big data messaging. Well, it's, you know what it is? It's clients are first recognizing that data is transformative for their organizations. I mean, it just new opportunity, new business models. Um, oh, that actually reminds me of a story. So you're gonna, we're going to have to come back to this one. Cloud, the intersection of cloud. Cloud's more transformative, not just from a delivery standpoint, but also fundamentally the expectation which gets into social, which is really the engagement side, right? People are all about uh, being on demand. I mean, uh, you know, the days of just being able to do email is a little bit passe. People want to be on text, communicating real time in the personas that they represent. So it's not just your work persona, but let's say your personal hobbies. You know, they want to be interacted with relevant in the time and context. And it's big news, obviously. WhatsApp got bought by Facebook for $19 billion, including the three billion retention bonus. Um, that's, I mean, that's a game changer right yes, there. Yes, I mean, that, absolutely. That is kind of a, a poster child for the massive, some say bubble, but some say sea change of what's going on in the world right now, which is anything could pop in terms of an application. Oh yeah, you know, what it is is really the consumer aspects in terms of the consumer expectations of the interaction self-service, the quality, the, the fact that it's seamless and easy, you have that expectation not just in terms of your personal life, you're actually bringing that expectation into the work life. And so there's a higher level of overall expectation around the experience that users have, business users have, technical users have, but now in the world of big data, the business users are saying, you know, I'd like access to the data. I wouldn't like to play with it. I don't necessarily want to have to wait until you give, get me a DBA who writes a JDBC driver script to you know, access that data and then the application guy that, that has to rewrite you know, the application. People we want had it Lance, on demand. We had Lance Crosby on, CEO of SoftLayer, who's the center of all the attention here at the cloud show, and we asked him about WhatsApp. He's like, it's disrupting a hundred billion dollar telco market. And and so I want to get your perspective. Obviously the telco is an area where there's a lot of big data you're involved in. Mobile World Congress is going on. Mark oh, Zuckerberg yeah. was giving the keynote and oh no, we're not trying to take over telco. <laughs> sure he is. Um, but what's your take on all? I mean, telcos have been at the center of cloud, center of big data. They just seem to be late to the party every well, time. Is that the case? Or you they know just what it is, is I, I think it's both the opportunity of um, having, first of all, generating a ton of data. So a couple telcos, um, both uh, uh, in the United States as well as uh, internationally, like one generates about 42 terabytes a day. Another is handling six billion call detail records a day. And just the sheer volume, they've got tons of infrastructure, right? Have invested a lot at all levels, BSS, OSS, as well as even trying to do um, more customer analytics in real time for not just quality of service, but now for marketing and campaign management and customer experience. But the challenge is, how do you do that in a much more effective way, more more optimized way, more predictive way, and that's really the opportunity. And we actually acquired um, a company called The Now Factory in October, really around that end-to-end -end experience. So how do you quickly access the data in the networks? How do you actually process that and curate that in real time, and then consume it in terms of understanding the data models that are developed, as well as running the analytics? And then, and then act on it. And Absolutely. It's a customer retention uh, 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 asset. What, what, what are they doing with the Now Factory? Oh, they're doing uh, several different things. So, at let's say in the in the um, operators, network operators, the quality of the service calls. It's much more about how do I shift from a re responsive, re reactive kind of scenarios mm -hmm. to be a little bit more proactive, and also understand. Hey, when a person was actually dropped from a call, when were they? Did they just board a flight? Then they landed, they landed, and now they're checking their Facebook, Twitter accounts, you know, what's the degree of activity, and you can see whether or not they're supposed to have a downfall or not based on 
the time. I mean, th that's getting at a level of individual user and user access on a device. So the second question is a lot of times f folks aren't sure exactly what's wrong with the phone. Is it the battery? Is it the, you, you've got 15 applications running on it and it's dying, you know. So understanding exactly where the quality of service and issues well, are is important. They, were, they came on the cube. Uh, Al Factory, yeah. I think we oh, good, yeah, good. Yeah. And this is a huge, huge um, aspect at, actually at, at Mobile World Congress. So tell us a story. Um, you're, uh, we had a great interview with you. You had great storytelling. Tell us a story. What's going on? Tell us, uh, that represents kind of the culture of what's happening in cloud and big data and the, in, in, in the world Well, today. you know, I had a, I, um, I had a really interesting... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Smiling. I had a really interesting conversation with a couple um, clients, one in banking in uh, based in Europe and one in insurance based in the U.S. And they were commenting about, you know, customer retention is actually huge, both for revenue and profit. Revenue from cross-seller products and profit because the longer you can retain the clients, it's better. So human logic or expectation is, hey, you know, if you want to retain a client, what do people think that they need to do? Maybe you get better products, higher levels of discount. One of the human behavior traits we discovered is if you actually lower the price points, i.e. change the rate, change the um, uh, uh, available prices for certain um, uh, accounts and products, it actually causes the customer to leave. And the reason it causes them to leave, even though you would think it would cause them to stay, after it hits a certain threshold, what happens is the human nature says, oh, well, maybe I might be more attractive to other vendors as well, and they start going shopping. So one of the things we've started to look at actually recently is looking at um, online dating surveys and information that, that's captured from online relationships, because what people say that they're going to do and what people end up actually doing sometimes aren't. <laughs> it's not like a dating profile, the picture from like 20 years ago. Yeah, but you're actually starting to marry that kind of insight with more business type information to really understand human behavior right? traits. I mean, right? even though it's not intuitive, it actually makes sense because a lot of these decisions are emotional. Right? It is. It's like going to the racetrack. Yeah, I'm going to bet on that. You get to the window, I'm going to change my mind. And then you end up making a different decision <laughs> based on something that some guy next door said, whatever it is. Right? All oh, kinds yeah. of information. You change your oh, mind, yeah. Do you change your mind a lot at the window? <laughs> I do, actually. It's not, it's not a good strategy. Actually, staying away from the racetrack is a very good strategy, especially when you got kids. You know? I used well, to spend a lot of time there, but now that I have four kids, I have better things to spend my hard-earned money on. But, uh, okay, but that's a good story, right? And one is an example of some of the non-intuitive things that you find in the big data world when you absolutely. actually have access to the well, data. Well, and also that you're marrying industry perspectives about uh, people, profiles, entities to get a more comprehensive understanding that you wouldn't necessarily have ever thought to put, you know, an insurance company with, you know. So I got to ask you. I got to ask you. Data sets around personal preferences. Right. Anyway, I got to ask you. What is the coolest thing you've seen here at IBM Pulse? Oh, Besides well. the cube. Oh, of course, of course. Well, you know, I'm a little bit biased, I would have to say, but the announcement of Cloudant, you know, that's uh, it, it's a really exciting um, announcement for us because it's it's about being present in the ways in which clients are actually developing the next generation of applications, especially to serve for mobile applications as well as what they're doing in the cloud, and. And it's such a unique business model. Were because, you involved in that deal? Um, yes, it's part of, um, it actually sits within the information management organization, and that is run by our general manager, Beth Smith. And so uh, Sean Pulley, uh, who's my peer, actually has that core responsibility for Cloudant. So this is a core part yeah, of Boston our overall base, big I know the core. founder, a uh, friend of mine, Rich Levendoff, did the seed round. Those guys were ex MIT guys and did yeah, a good yeah, job. Yeah. Uh, how big were they when you guys knew it? What's the size of them now? I mean, uh, well, we don't actually talk about it because it's a private... Um, <laughs> no, they're employees. Oh, oh. Um, you know? Yeah. It's a small team. Yeah, it's a huge. small team. No, no, it's not huge. It's oh. a small team. And actually what we um, have 100? been... That, yeah, we, uh, what we've been talking about really <laughs> is more about we'll out, kind so. of the... I, I know, you, I'm sure you can find out in a, in a nanosecond there. Um, <laughs> is more about the clients and the clients that are actually using it. Both... Uh, the clients that are actually paying for the set of capabilities, as well as the clients that are just using the freemium versions. So, and that's actually quite high. That's almost like twenty thousand. So, talk a little bit more about uh, cloud. It's database as a service. It's no SQL. Talk about a little bit more about what they do, and then why it's important for a cloud-based offering. How you're going to, you know, bring it into soft layer, maybe. Yeah, so first of all, um, Cloudant's been a, a strategic partner with IBM on SoftLayer. 
um, mm -hmm. is actually the uh, preferred for clients to get started. Now, the thing that's been um, interesting for IBM in general is you, the innovations that are happening in the data world have spanning the spectrum from um, no SQL to not only SQL to <laughs> SQL, right? Uh, it is, is all about clients wanting to both leverage new capabilities that allow application agility and flexibility. They want capabilities around um, enabling higher performance and speed and also cost reduction. And um, the pattern that I'm actually seeing is, for example, like even in the Hadoop world, a big, big movement toward being able to apply SQL, right? Because there sure. aren't enough map reduced programmers. Yeah. And part of the value of also NoSQL in areas like CloudNet is about allowing application developers to be able to write and quickly program things that they need uh, without necessarily having to, you know, have the number of traditional resources. So this is all about speed. It's speed in terms of the data, speed in terms of the application agility. And flexibility too. You can store data and not knowing what you want to do with it yet. Yeah. NoSQL is beautiful because you don't have to go into a schema design. That's right. And, That's and right. when you do know, you can just throw some SQL on it and, and apply that. So, so given NoSQL has been popular with modern developers, it also has been a real boom for the social media world. Um, so I want to get your take on social data. Um, mm. As it moves out from social media being kind of a promotional PR thing to actually more of an engagement, you guys are talking transactional, there's a lot of analytics, Watts has got this discovery capabilities. All this stuff's happening around big data, around social interaction, you yeah. mentioned human behavior with dating. You're seeing the humanization fusion of data. So I want to get your take on two things, social media data, mm -hmm. what that means for engagement, and the fusion of data, how does that get fused into practices? Okay, so, well, uh, both questions a little bit loaded, so I'm going to give you a real tangible example. One of the things we're really trying to do uh, in the context of big data is that it's really about uncertain data and putting some degree of understanding around it. Not, you don't have to necessarily know everything to the nth degree, but it's some degree of order and indexing and uh, searchability and discoverability. So one of the things we've been doing um, recently is, and we have a couple examples of clients wanting to do this in healthcare as well as financial services sector, is most clients have what, an enterprise warehouse of some sort or transactional system that says, hey, you are in fact John and you are in fact Dave, but you may have 50 different social handles that are very different than an enterprise ID that says here's name, address, email. So we have a capability called Big Match, which takes um, capabilities like probabilistic matching, traditionally found in master data management capabilities, and enabled that for you to apply with a higher degree of confidence to resolve entities and IDs of people even when their social IDs may not be apparent that they are in fact those individuals. Yeah. And so, so you, we, you yeah. can infer from fuzzy information more about that individual. With a high can, degree of probability. A lot of we people actually, working on that, it's a hard problem. Well, and I'm going to give you a data point. So we actually ran an internal test and we were able to identify 10 million IDs in one second. Great. On Hadoop. Wow. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so uh, you know, that's at the scale of several times faster than what you would expect out of not only traditional and relational database management systems, but the degree of precision around knowing those entities is really That's exciting. called Big Match? It's called and, Big Match. And that's and in production now, or is it sort of? We do, we just delivered it in the fourth quarter. Um, and it's a, it's a, and the original genesis of it was actually to use, um, you guys know Jeff Jonas too. Yeah. Some of the capabilities. Um, the puzzle piece man. <laughs> yeah. He's always talking puzzle pieces. <laughs> yeah. Superman. It's all, it's all <laughs> about what, actually, and what Jeff and I recently had a conversation, we're actually calling this space in general around context computing is what we call it. So making sense, um, putting context to the data. Uh, it's an incremental programming thought which says every piece of data could actually cause you to step back and relook at your expectations or assumptions around the data set. And um, big match is just fantastic because it's it's about people that were like trying to like not be found and now we're using that for areas so that how are does the, good, how, how not does, just bad. So one big conversation <laughs> so, here is the developer ecosystem. How does a startup mm -hmm that wants to work with IBM, engage with you guys for big data. So say, say random, the next WhatsApp's potentially out there. Yes. Um, you have you know six guys working on a product that's somewhat shipping, um, and it's big data, social data. How do they 
engage with Ibm. Is there a partnership program? You guys have an ecosystem. We do. We do. We actually have just launched Blue Mix, which I think everyone is aware of now. Mm -hmm. um, and also on SoftLayer, we're enabling a lot of our middleware services capabilities on SoftLayer. And we actually just. Um, enabled both uh, Blue Stratus, which is our DB2 Blue acceleration capabilities, our in-memory capabilities uh, on SoftLayer. Um, so really a self uh, self service BI data warehousing capability. And then we're also enabling our Big Insights Hadoop services, so MapReduce on SoftLayer as another capability. And we're very focused on an entire ecosystem. So the ecosystem is a set of um, uh, clients who and partners who want to expose particular APIs, who want to make um, certain sets of applications uh, available, as well as even data sets available for the marketplace. So I would think as a big data exec, you want to bring as, as many big data services, whether Hadoop or, or, or other, into the cloud. And running yeah, the absolutely, so, absolutely. And most clients actually want to marry their data with third-party data and another data set. And, and derive some, you know, in public data, to derive some meaningful insight. And to do that, it means that we've got to have a lot more common um, interfaces to be able to access the data and be able to also run analytics in it. So what should we expect there? I mean, you're, you're the IBM Hadoop distro, I mean, other analytics services? Uh, more, more services. You know, we're really shifting toward enabling agile analytics. Um, and we're also um, shifting toward what I con consider more continuous insight and actionable insight when in the middle of a process, right? In real time, in context. So, so what's the big milestones for you this year to knock down in terms of on the business front, partnerships, mm. competition, landscape, uh, revenue projections? Can you share some data? Oh, sure. So the biggest, I would say one of the biggest um, areas that I've interacted with clients recently is even in the telco space and financial services, data monetization. Like how do they do it? And one of the things that they've said is now I want privacy baked in into the capability. So historically you would have thought investments around privacy, security, governance were afterthoughts or because of either breach or risk or, you know, um, risk. Now people are actually being much more proactive and saying I actually want to set money aside from a growth standpoint because I realize this has uh, huge value. Is it an insurance policy or is it actual products they're buying? Oh, products, real products. So it's actually methods and products. So the method meaning what's the stewardship? What's the data steward role? What's a data officer, chief data officer role? Who actually has the rights on you, uh, determining what data has what value set? What are some of the techniques to apply in terms of user authentication and access? Um, in terms of growth, my expectation is we're going to continue to see huge growth. We actually saw in some of our um, key technology areas over 100% growth last year. I mean, huge. So I, this is an exciting place. Um, and my expectation is I don't look at the competition maybe not the way um, everyone would expect, which is my belief is uh, in, in the market right now, because people are both understanding and trying to develop new applications and what uh, some of the new technologies provide you is an opportunity to actually grow the entire market. So my preference is more programmers, more data developers actually engaging actually drives a bigger market opportunity size for everybody. You mentioned uh, the chief data officer. What's um, What are you seeing in terms of trends for the CDO? What industries are taking up you know, the, da the data czar, yeah. the CDO? And is that individual reporting into the CIO, or is it a, a separate autonomous organization? So we've had, um, a, that's a good question. We've uh, actually, and even Gartner's done a study on it recently. So uh, this a CDO role has been emerging, almost growing at double digits, um, both at the C-suite level as well as one level below. In many cases, they're actually bridging between both um, uh, either the uh, IT organization or in the business organization. In some cases, they've actually pulled it out separately. I've seen it most in financial services sector, healthcare, and um, um, government, uh, mainly because it's highly regulated, right? Any industry that's highly regulated in terms of how that data is, is handled. Uh, the last piece, too, uh, in terms of uh, the role is they really sit in between the organization, IT, technic, um, and, and business, and having an understanding of the key metrics and having the right people in the organization to say what are the key sources, you know, what degree of control, what degree of sandbox experimentation that they provision um, for for their uh, multiple requests and teams become really important. Yeah, we're doing a conference in July with uh, with MIT. Mm. It's a CDO symposium. They're doing a lot of research in this area, so you know, look for that. 
In here, I want to ask you a final question because we're on time here. Uh, sure. Always great to have you. What are you personally excited about right now in the, in the world within IBM, outside IBM? What, what's, what's got your attention right now? Um, probably the most exciting aspect is real time and context computing. The combination of the two. I mean, just the being able to not only enable not just machine to machine and, and connected car type scenarios and deep industrial sector asset heavy intensive you know industries with a lot of data but it's actually also about enabling everyone I mean it's it's really democratizing the ability to have insight for everyone without necessarily all having to be a PhD or a data scientist or a big quant guy right so the thing that's exciting for me is liberation I, yeah it's, it is really is about liberation so it's being able to apply much more um, uh, kind of uh, insights at the moment, at the right time, context, place for the individual, knowing the entity fully. And then the second is just enabling everybody, the masses, everybody to be able to. Uh, to I always play. said, you know, we, we are into crowdsourcing and crowd dynamics. We do a lot of research. It's about behavioral and contextual. The behavior is the crowd and the context is everything. So I love that context angle. I think that's really cool. I love the agile analytics, I think that is going to be like a search engine. You know, <laughs> Watson-like, I mean, although Steve Mills was saying that Watson is going to be the the, the source of truth, Dave's rolling oh, his absolutely. eyes. Oh, absolutely. Dave was rolling his eyes. Because <laughs> we're always like, is there one version of the truth? And he's, he's like, it's Watson. Um, oh, yeah. I mean, Watson is absolutely phenomenal. It's just great humanization. He, he but clarified it, statistical version of the truth. <laughs> <laughs> is that what he, <laughs> he had to backpedal on that. But that was good. It, was, it was a good conversation. Uh, great to have you on theCUBE. Um, great to see you again. Thanks for uh, meeting with us last night. It was always good to meet some of the team. This is theCUBE. I'm John Furrier with Dave Vellante. Exclusive coverage from Silicon Angles theCUBE here at IBM Pulse, IBM's premier cloud show. Cloud meets big data. IBM is on a roll. We'll be right back after this short break. <laughs>